Good evening, everybody. We're going to call our meeting to order. Um, we're going to have a roll call by our city clerk, Kathy Valdez. The record shall reflect that all members are present. If you'll all rise, we're going to have a Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Rigby. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Okay, and with that... Hold on. Oh, did the Saturday, Saturday, December 7th was Pearl Harbor Day. Let us take a moment to reflect and honor the military and civilian dead and the thousands of others who survived the attack on Pearl Harbor 78 years ago. These individuals demonstrated remarkable resiliency, courage, and teamwork, even when still under attack. The spirit, determination, bravery, and resolve of these heroes stand as a model for all Americans throughout the ages. We owe them a depth of gratitude, and I would like to just honor them this evening, or this, yeah, this evening, still evening, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, this evening. So um, I just think it's a um, thing that we could do, just have a moment to reflect and honor them. And with that, we'll go on with our meeting. And um, in accordance with the Brown Act, I'd like to announce that as a result of convening simultaneous meetings, the members of the Buena Sanitation District will receive compensation of $147.75 for the district meeting pursuant to Buena Sanitation District Ordinance 2006-1. I'd like to remind everyone that the Vista Municipal Code requires members of the public to observe order and decorum at the meeting and to conduct themselves in a courteous manner. The ordinance was adopted to allow for public input and to facilitate city business without disruption of the meeting. Applause is appropriate um, for the items listed under the presentation portion of the agenda only. Attendees should remain seated during the meeting and persons in needing to stand are requested to step outside the city council chambers where video and audio of the meeting are playing. This is also listed on our agenda cover sheet. Um, the students wishing to receive credit for attending this evening's meeting must stay for a minimum of one hour. However, we ask that you stay for the com completion of an item rather than leaving in the middle of a discussion. When you're ready to leave, you can ask one of the sheriff deputies or a staff member in the back of the room to sign your paper. So last night we had lots of, or last night there was a meeting that had lots of students. Not so many tonight I don't see out here. Um, to speak on an item on the agenda, please fill out a speaker slip with a number of the item you want to speak on and give it to the city clerk secretary. Speaker slips are available just outside the city council ch um, chambers. And so with that, I go to the approval of our agenda, city manager Patrick Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. There are no changes this evening. And our city attorney, Daryl Piper, will bring us out of our closed session. Thank you, Mayor. The City Council did meet in closed session to discuss item CS1 on this evening's closed close session agenda. No action was taken that's required to be reported. Okay, that brings us to our consent calendar. The recommendations on the following consent calendar will be enacted in one motion unless an item is removed from the calendar. And any member of the public can remove an item by submitting a request to speak card to the clerk secretary. Items removed from the consent calendar will be considered immediately following the adoption of the calendar. And we have 20 consent items this evening. And so with that, we have um, one item pulled, C14, pulled by um, a speaker. And do I have any items pulled by our council? If not, I would entertain a motion for the balance of the consent calendar minus C14. I move to approve the balance of the consent calendar. Councilmember Rigby? I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. That motion passes unanimously. So that brings us to um, item number C14, and we'll hear the speaker first, Matt. Are you on? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Kathy. Um, yeah, is this where you guys are appointing officials for the upcoming year for these these boards? Um, Sandag, North County Transit. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, do you have a question? Yeah. yeah so who's the, be... the question is: Are you up, are you appointing these your your positions for the upcoming year? And yes, they are for the yes. two, 2020 year. And then to follow up with that, who is A and who is B? 
I can't, you have to, can you speak uh, in the microphone? Can, can you speak clear? I'm not understanding what you're saying, I'm sorry. Yeah, who's gonna be appointed to represent us on SANDAG? We have three of us, actually. I, I'm, I'm the person that will represent you, and then we have an alternate, Councilmember Rigby and Councilmember Green. Okay, and then also uh, North County um, Transit Board is the uh, same representatives there, Franklin. Right, okay. that's correct. Yeah, this is like a big one. I mean, maybe it's just because I was driving on the 78 today and there's just like a ton of traffic and in general, civilization kind of like breaks down in traffic and people don't treat each other as well. Uh, so, I mean, this is like a huge priority for, for our city and for our region at large. Um, so I'd ask those four of you that did get appointed to this uh, board's boards um, to take this um, issue with the most seriousness. Uh, for example, you know, I would appreciate it if um, Councilmember Franklin actually kind of used the North County transit system as a way of sort of finding out the faults and, and ways we can improve on, upon that. And well, with Sandeg, I mean, good luck. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, um, I would need a motion for item C14. Councilmember Rigby? I'll move that we approve item C14 as presented. Okay, I have a second. Second. Okay, please cast your votes. That motion passes unanimously. That brings us to our public hearings. We have three public hearings this evening, and the first public hearing is to receive testimony regarding amendments to Title V of the Municipal Code relating to cannabis enterprises, Title 18 of the Development Code, and the Vista Business Park Specific Plan relating to cannabis-related uses and extension of a moratorium relating to can cannabis-related uses. So the public hearing is now open. Community Development and Engineering Director John Conley will provide the staff report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. The cannabis amendments, as I'm calling them, are before you this evening. Staff received direction in August of this year to allow for some changes with it, specifically within the Vista Business Park specific plan, to allow for testing facilities, to allow for up to two manufacturing facilities with a special use permit, up to two distribution facilities with a special use permit, all within the Vista Business Park for cannabis-related uh, businesses and allow for cannabis delivery within the city. So the staff is proposing a number of amendments tonight that are before you to fulfill this uh, direction. So first are the development code amendments. Those are to chapters 1802 and 1806 of the development code. This would remove the blanket prohibition against cannabis-related uses that we established and with the changes that were brought by Measure Z would clarify the definitions and uses within that portion of the code, but would prohibit all or continue to prohibit all other cannabis related uses. Within the Vista Business Park specific plan, which is area specific, uh, the area B, which is the light industrial zone, would allow unlimited cannabis testing facilities, up to two cannabis distribution facilities with an SUP, up to two manufacturing facilities with an SUP, all following the council's direction. Uh, these distribution, manufacturing, and testing uses would follow the state of California's definitions and categories. This is a map of the Vista Business Park specific plan. Area B, which is in white, surrounded by red, is the light industrial and business support group. These are the areas that are light industrially zoned that would allow the testing, manufacturing, and distribution uses. The areas D, A, E, C, and F, the other colored areas would be excluded. Just for clarification, uh, are all of these uses required to obtain a special use permit? Only manufacturing and distribution. The testing use would not require a special use permit. And what was the, what, what's your thought? on why we would not require a special use permit. That was just the direction that received from the council in August. Is there any uh, reason that you can think of uh, in your capacity why we would not want a, an SUP? For testing? Yes, and for I all of the uses. Um, the discussion, uh, if I remember in August, was that testing would occur in sort of a laboratory setting. It would be a uh, like an R&D type of a use, it wouldn't allow a heavy um, use of the product itself, and there wouldn't be a, um, a lot of you know, cannabis you'd have to deal with, and so an SUP seemed to be more than what would be needed. And for 
clarification, there's licensing requirements that will go along with these uses that will also apply to these testing facilities. So there's layers of regulatory review. We thought a special use permit was just at the staff level too much because it regulates use and the use is fairly benign. What about conditional or minor use permit? Either of those make sense? You could certainly impose that. Our, our, a conditional use permit is the same for us as a special use permit, so a minor use permit would be an administrative review of the similar issues. I'd like to suggest that we consider a minor use permit, if that's a significantly lower threshold, but still gives us some administrative purview. I, I'd just like to know, I'd like, to, I'd like these businesses to walk in an application and for us to know who they are and, and understand what they're doing and, and you know, be, I'd like us to have a, a relationship. Uh, so if there's no uh, reason that we can think of why we wouldn't want to do a, an MUP. Okay. Can we let them continue the report and then we'll talk about that when sure. we get through? Okay. At the current time, what's recommended is that testing would not require a use permit. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're also recommending some changes to the municipal code uh, to address the licensing of delivery and these would require re include requirements for a delivery service license for the business itself, certain operating requirements for the cannabis delivery services like hours of operation, insurance requirements, et cetera, driver work permits to verify that they have valid licenses and are of age, and allow for inspection of premises and records by city staff. There's also changes to Chapter 5 of the Municipal Code to add 5.98, which would address the licensing of testing, distribution, and manufacturing facilities also known as cannabis enterprises. This would also include a license of the facility, would also address operating requirements for the enterprise uses, and types of the hours that they could operate and the types of facilities they could operate within. They would have employee work permits to again verify age, and it would allow for inspection, again, of records and premises by the city. For Councilman Franklin's clarification, this is sort of what I was alluding to before. There are layers of review, so the licensing would still apply to the testing facility but the land use control of a use permit we didn't feel was necessary. We're also recommending an urgency ordinance to extend the current moratorium on cannabis related land uses until the code amendments take effect. Our current moratorium expires today and the extension would cover the time period until the amendments to the development code take effect. The extension of the moratorium would require a four-fifths vote. Zoning amendments and formal rec require formal recommendation by the Planning Commission prior to the Council's consideration. The Commission reviewed this request in November of this year and recommended, sorry, there's a typo there, um, of this year and recommended that cannabis manufacturing and distribution facilities established within the business park be located at least 600 feet from any residentially zoned property. So I have a, I'll come back to this, I have a, uh, visual that shows, Kathy, can you take me to the last slide, which includes these areas that are the business park locations um, that would be appropriately zoned within 600 feet of residential. These are at the corner of South Melrose, which runs a little north south along the left, and Sycamore, which runs along the top. If we could go back, I'm sorry. Thank you. So the formal staff recommendations are to continue the moratorium, amend the development code, amend the Vista Business Park specific plan, and amend the municipal code, adding the two chapters to, ch to Title V. And we will also have licensing requirements, um, permit fees for the licensing requirements that'll come back in early 2020 for your review. And that completes my staff report, thank you. Okay, I have um, seven speakers, so I take the speakers first. Can I just clarify, sure. uh, just not, not commenting on, but clarifying. Um, so that, could you back up uh, that map that you showed within 600 feet of residential? Oh. Okay, so right there. So I'm, what are you telling us about this zone? Wh which zone letter is that? This is the area within the Vista Business Park specific plan that would allow for testing, manufacturing, and distribution, but is within 600 feet of residential. So per the Planning Commission's recommendation, if you were to adopt their recommendation, these parcels that are outlined in red would not be able to have any of those uses on, right. on their site. Okay, I certainly support that. Um, and then just further clarification, so you're saying we're, we are requiring a license from the city 
that does give us administrative uh, purview. Over their operating That's requirements and their separate from an security, MUP. et cetera. Yes, there's an, a number of provisions in the code amendment before you that so address we'll, that. So we'll still be able to place conditions on the operators for the licensing requirements. Right. Okay. And that's for all of these types of businesses. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, with that I will Okay, the speakers. Okay, we'll start with um Becky Rapp and, and if the I'll call three of you and if the other, one will come up to stand and the other two will wait over here. So it's Becky Rapp followed by um, looks like Rian Fletcher and then Padyama Ashak. Is it Fatima? Maybe? Okay. Okay, good evening. My name is Becky Rapp. <clears throat> As a parent and community member, I support the moratorium. However, I have great concern with the idea of changing municipal code that could possibly create leniency for the marijuana industry or more marijuana businesses <clears throat> in town. I feel like the city is making decisions based on assumptions and not facts. Two of the 11 marijuana outlets from Prop Z have opened just recently, and it is still very early to know what community problems, neighborhood nuisances, and calls for services by code enforcement and the sheriff there will be. VISTA citizens and city council members need that information before they consider uh, regulation for other types of marijuana businesses. We do know, though, through experience with illegal operations, VISTA has seen an increase in service calls to the Sheriff's Department and the commission of certain types of crimes, including break-ins, illegal cultivation, processing, and manufacturing, all associating with environmental damage. I would suggest you give these decisions more time. Wait and see what ramifications come from decisions that have already been made. If you're interested in facts, I would highly encourage you to consider opening testing facilities. We still don't have any permitted facilities in San Diego County, and it's very important for the products for manufacturers to be tested. Vaping cartridges have been proven to be very dangerous. According to the CDC, marijuana vaping cartridges tested found the vapors they produced were filled with high levels of pesticides and other harmful substances. One of the products, Maui Waui, contained 15,000 times the legal limit of pesticides. Antonio Frazier, the Vice President of Operations at the Los Angeles CannaSafe, one of the nation's leading marijuana testing firms, said, I'll be willing to bet that some of these are over what they would consider a fatal dose. He added, people don't die from smoking a pack of cigarettes, which is what we're seeing with some of these vape products. People are actually dying over a month of use. I ask you to send a message to the community that you are more interested in the public's health and safety. Any marijuana businesses should be carefully located as possible in relationship to where youth congregate. 600 feet from a residential community park or youth-oriented facility or other sensitive use business is way too close. Send a message to the people that you will protect the youth by creating larger distances. I have a handout with, those, with that information, um, with those facts that I said in the talk. Thank you. So Rianne? followed by Fatima, followed by Jessica Palmer. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Fletcher, and I'm the media specialist with North Coastal Prevention Coalition. It's also known as NCPC. And NCPC is, is um, the mission is to reduce the harm of alcohol, tobacco, um, marijuana, and other drugs in the city of Vista through community action, education, support, and collaboration. Now, looking at VISTA's 2030 general plan under the Healthy VISTA element, the goal number one states VISTA will work with community partners to improve overall health and well-beings of VISTAs. We want to be that resource for VISTA to help educate the public for potential public health risks associated with marijuana deliveries, distributions, and manufacturing facilities in VISTA. As you may know currently, that the League of California Cities are suing the California Bureau of Cannabis Control due to home delivery services with concerns of robberies, easier youth access, and potentially an increase in illegal sellers blending in with licensed delivery fleets. Now, I believe that the City of Vista would benefit by waiting to see if these legal cases turn out and before making further policies to increase marijuana policies to help enforcement address illegal marijuana delivery businesses and to give law enforcement the proper tools to handle these specific issues. Thank you. Thank you. Fatima, 
followed by Jessica Palmer, uh, followed by Kathleen Lippitt. Good evening, everyone. My name is Fatima Ashak, a prevention specialist with the North Coastal Prevention Coalition, known as NCPC, and a resident of Vista. I've worked in the alcohol and other drug prevention field for the last seven years, and during the time, I've seen tobacco and marijuana products transform to be very profitable and appealing to youth. When talking about manufacturing marijuana products, it's very important to note the new epidemic associated with the outbreak of vaping. I think we're all familiar with that. Uh, according to the CDC and the FDA, this outbreak now has a name, and it's called Evali. The CDC recommends that people should not use THC-containing e-cigarette uh, vaping products. As of last week, the CDC reported 48 deaths contributed to Evali. Just four days ago, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health reported six people having vaping illnesses from vaping products purchased from licensed marijuana dispensaries. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's safe, and I think it's our job to make sure moving forward that we do the best we can to make it as safe as possible. It's our duty to protect youth and make sure Vista doesn't become the beacon of youth marijuana use. We think there should be a ban on THC vaping products in Vista. Adopting total smoke vape-free outdoor policies can help prevent second and third hand smoking exposure and help reach your Healthy Vista Element Policy 1.8 outlined in your 2030 general plan. We hope you lean on us as a resource and we would appreciate an opportunity to collaborate on putting Vista's health in the forefront. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, Jessica Palmer followed by Kathleen Lippert followed by uh, John Jesse. Hi, I am Jessica Palmer. I am a senior at Rancho Buena Vista High School. I'm also vice president of the Public Policy Club, and we work um, in direct connection with North, North Coastal Prevention Youth Coalition. And um, it's my job here today to bring the youth into this equation, and I think that the youth isn't being considered enough in these regulations on marijuana. And I'm concerned about the increase in use with my peers. And I think that these locations, especially in pro close prox proximity to um, residencies and schools, is not helping this epidemic that's occurring with underage st uh, students and youth. And I just want the council to consider the youth when discussing and considering specific policies and regulations on marijuana. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Lippitt, followed by uh, John Jesse, followed by Gioni Ramirez. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. My name is Kathleen Lippitt. I'm mother of two adult children and two grandchildren, and I'm a public health practitioner for over 20 years as an advocate of sound public policies that support good choices and maximize, act, that maximize academic and career opportunities of youth, enhance workplace safety, road safety, physical and mental health of residents, and productivity. The commercialization of marijuana businesses increases increasing access to a drug that undermines all of these qualities of life by allowing the production, access, sale, and distribution of marijuana couldn't be more antithetical to a sound public health policy. Marijuana profiteers, attorneys, advocates, and aficionados entice electeds to cooperate with the marijuana industry's campaign to normalize marijuana for reasons of financial gain, whether in the form of campaign assistance, promises of windfall taxes, promises uh, that marijuana operators would follow every rule and regulation the city might impose, promises of product safety, of responsible marijuana operators and operations. Unpermitted shops would close, although providing no historical evidence for that to happen. In fact, the reverse is true. Medicinal marijuana businesses also leaves the door open for 18-year-olds to buy, use, and divert to other peers and younger teens. Regarding the city's distance requirements from sensitive uses, 600 feet is a very short walk. The average residential lot can be about 100 feet, so that's about six houses. 
two significant sensitive uses that cities typically fail to respect are treatment and recovery centers. And I would respectfully request that those sensitive uses be added. It is very concerning that Vista only just started to deal with the marijuana outlets, adding two marijuana production facilities and two delivery services before your testing facilities are in place, certified testing facilities, seems unwise. With all the news of the lung injuries and deaths from vaping and warning from the CDC, I would like to point out that it is these manu marijuana manufacturing facilities that are the sources of these products. And contrary to earlier contentions that those problems were limited to illicit manufacturers, it turns out that the permitted ones are as culpable. Though some electeds have been led to believe that regulating will assuage marijuana attorneys and prevent litigation or allow the city to remain in control of the issue, the reverse is true. Some cities have naively invited marijuana consultants from the industry who convinced them to adopt a strategy called development agreements. In reality, these are agreements which will take away your local control Thank you. permanently. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, John Jesse, followed by Gioni Ramirez. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. My name is John Jesse. I am one of the four licensed medical marijuana dispensaries open to date. Uh, Dr. Green RX, I want to talk about a few points tonight. I want to talk about voters. I want to talk about tax revenue and children. I'm going to cover them really quick, and I'm going to get to my points. The first one is the medical re recommendations versus adult use. Here in Vista, Measure Z was approved by almost 54%. The same constituents voted for Prop 64 at almost 57%. They didn't really read this measure. They're coming into my store. They're upset. They don't think you're listening to them. They want to be heard. Medical marijuana, it's really up to a personal choice whether you medicate for your own personal reasons. 130 people die a day for opioids. You know how many people are coming to the stores to actually get cannabis? It's a safer alternative. Children should not have marijuana, that's for sure, but it's unfortunate that most of the marijuana or drugs come from the household. We cannot go into their houses and govern them. I'm so sorry. I am, feel for all the people here for the children that get drugs and for the people that are addicted to drugs. But marijuana is a much safer compound. It's a plant as opposed to an opioid. Now, as far as tax revenues, I know you guys are balancing your budget. I'm sorry to hear that based on the anticipated revenue. We're talking possibly a million dollars. It's going to go up probably two, three million dollars if you go ahead and just allow adult use, 21 and up. I have people that are working at JB Homes across the, the way. They want to come spend their money here for their cannabis. They don't want to get a note. They live in San Diego. They don't understand what's going on. They're pretty, they're pretty upset. I do welcome the Coalition for Drug Abuse people to talk with me about this. Um, you're talking to us. Hello. No, I know. I'm just telling them yeah, to. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did not know the rules and I apologize. Um, but I just want to bring those up to you. These are the people that voted for you, whether you like it or not, it's here. The sky hasn't fallen. It hasn't fallen in San Diego. So please, I do appreciate that you guys have moved this through, and I hope that you do delivery so the people in wheelchairs and old people that can't drive can get their medicine too. But please consider adult use. Thank you. Okay, Gione Ramirez. Hi everyone, my name is Gianni Ramirez. Thank you for taking the time to um, hear me out. This is my first time here. Um, I would just like to state that I, what I'm hearing is a lot of panic, a lot of scaredness, a lot of what about the children, what about um, 18 and over getting it for the younger th kids. The same thing applies to alcohol and cigarettes, but what do we do? We, we place restrictions, we placed laws, we did everything that we could to possibly minimize that effect. And if we're scared about the same thing happening with cannabis, that's why we're here. These rules, we're not against them. Um, I would say that everything in San Diego, I mean, if you look at statistics, I don't have any crazy CDC facts, but I can tell you that I have plenty of experience. I've been working in the cannabis industry for quite a while, and I've seen a lot of what I would say older clientele it isn't just children, it isn't your grandma, it isn't your mom anymore, it's everyone. So whether or not you're using it for your kid to treat a disease or chronic illness, I mean, I think that's personally up to that person. Um, I'm not 
for children taking cannabis, obviously. But I think that as long as we place restrictions and abide by the laws and we have constant checks, I mean, the same thing happens with alcohol and, and cigarettes. We do that already and we make sure that those um, laws are being followed. So I don't, I see great potential and I know that right now the revenue isn't what you might have expected, but that's because a lot of people are mad. And by placing these rules and pushing it back further and making it so um, we're jumping holes, you're only direct, you're only pushing those people back into the black market, which is actually worse because they don't have testing. They don't have the equipment or the needs to do what regular shops are. I have heard plenty of people say that there's no places to get it tested. That's not true. San Diego has a bunch of places that they send their plates, their products to get tested. Everything comes back with the certificate of analysis. I heard a Maui Waui strain having more than said uh, pesticides. Again, where did they get that from? Was that the black market or was that something that's already being tested and clean? There's definitely a lot of vaping deaths that have happened and I feel for those people. But it's also because they're uneducated and they're going to the black market thinking that they can get a quick fix for a f lower cost. If you place it so that people are able to go into the legal shops with a quick, easy one too, I think that you will see a dramatic decrease in the people dying, people um, trying to get around and go to the black market. You push those out and I guarantee you everything will be just as it is with alcohol and cigarettes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. That's our last speaker. So, um, Councilman Franklin, you're, you're, did you, is that from last time? Or you, nope. Okay. I uh, <clears throat> just wanted to weigh in and uh, say, uh, just give some general thoughts and comments here. Um, the four uses that are before us right now are testing facilities, which I think we've all agreed uh, if the product uh, the, the voters, the City of Vista, uh, it was their will that the product be sold here. It certainly makes sense for testing facilities uh, to be available so that we make sure that consumers uh, have access to safe products. I don't think any of us disagree with that. Uh, it should be said that none of the four business uh, businesses here, excuse me, well, let me start with the, with the testing, manufacturing, and distribution. These are not retail uses. Uh, these will not cause uh, foot traffic, parking issues, uh, or other issues uh, that are associated with retail uses. And so when we consider detriment to the community or nuisance to the community, uh, I think because these are not retail uses, we can eliminate some of those ideas. Uh, as for delivery, which is a retail and is fundamentally a resident, you know, retail and residential, the issue uh, and the, the discussion the council has been having is there are dozens, maybe hundreds of illegal operators that will now deliver to neighborhoods in Vista. And we have uh, our Measure Z folks who have gone through the, the licensing process, they followed the rules, they paid for their permits. And because they have a permit to protect, they uh, are not going to break the law, hopefully, and and deliver without uh, the lawful ability to do that. So then the issue is, uh, do we want to disadvantage our legal operators from the ability to deliver when their illegal black market uh, competitors are going to deliver into Vista because they're not licensed to do business here? They're they're already doing it. So the, the question is whether we want to disadvantage those who are legally doing business in Vista. Um, so I think that's where I come down and saying I'd rather have somebody who's licensed, uh, who's collecting sales tax on those transactions. Uh, I'd rather have you have the ability to deliver to Vista households uh, legally than to accept the fact that there are on weed maps a dozen plus places that will deliver uh, anywhere in the city of Vista right now against the law. So that's the issue is, you know, how do we want to treat those legal businesses operating in, in the city of Vista? Um, manufacturing facilities, we have, uh, again, is not a retail use. 
Uh, I don't believe that it's a detriment uh, to the community. Uh, we're not allowing for volatile substances to be used in manufacturing. Uh, that would be the kind of uh, manufacturing, the volatile uses would be the kind of manufacturing used to make uh, some of the products that go into the vaping and, and others. Um, but we are suggesting that uh, some of the, the legal products could be made here, uh, up to two businesses. Uh, and then we will come back and, and reanalyze how these businesses have affected uh, the community. Distribution uh, is the kind of business that serves legal businesses. Uh, again, we're, we're uh, requesting to allow it to, uh, to two uh, distribution facilities. So, you know, I, I uh, certainly support the Planning Commission's uh, recommendation that um, we prohibit this use uh, within 600 feet of, of residences. I think that's, that's rightful. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that we have a, a licensure, uh, an application process that gives us the purview. Now, does that license, how, often, how good is, how, how long is that license good for before they have to reapply? I believe it's an annual renewal, but we'll confirm that. And the way we would with an MUP or an SUP, do we have the, the force of law to close this business down if they're not compliant with the terms of our licensure? Yes, we can suspend their license or expire their license and close them down as a result of that. Okay. And the staff recommendation includes quarterly on site um, inspections and an annual audit, all of which would require if there was anything that wasn't within compliance with the, the SUP or any of the licensing requirements, corrective action, and if that wasn't made, potentially to, to remove the SUP. And in the case where an SUP is not required, is there still a proposed a quarterly inspection for those? What are we calling that licensure again that's separate from the SUP? It's called out in the uh, proposed ordinance before you as a as a regulatory compliance quarterly inspection. Uh -huh. what, what what nomenclature do we assign to this license that we're going to require? How do we define that or describe it? It's a cannabis enterprise license. Cannabis enterprise license. Okay, so all the, all the businesses before Sierra would require a cannabis enterprise license. With the exception of delivery, which is a separate license. Which is a separate license. Okay. And uh, these businesses will all be required to pay for the, the quarterly, uh, the, the cost of inspection, the cost of audit? Correct. And those fees will come back before you as a, with the recommendation to um, establish fees for the cost recovery. Okay. Um, I do not have any further uh, comments at this time. Councilmember Green. All right. I just want to echo a whole lot of what uh, Councilmember Franklin said. I do believe that these are not detrimental to the... Uh, community based off of what type of facilities that they are. Um, I also had a question as far as how often the license are renewed, but I think that you answered that one. Um, as far as uh, the delivery goes, um, is there a particular requirement? I know that we just discussed it, but I'd just like to get it out there for the public, for the actual drivers who are delivering. Um, we do have specific requirements for everybody who's going to deliver even through our legal dispensaries, correct? Yes, they would require a cannabis work permit. Um, the live scan that we already have in place for the Measure Z employee, business employees and um, um, operators, as well as insurance on the vehicle. Okay, and that's got to be renewed annually as well? Correct. Okay. And then they have the same business licensing process that every other business has, right, where they have to report the revenues, pay based off the revenues and sales tax and all that good stuff. And we have that same regulation and jurisdiction Correct. on every other business. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think we spent a lot of time talking about what we wanted you to come up with, and I feel like based off of what you guys came up with, it's exactly what we had requested. So I would definitely agree with staff's recommendations, and I do also um, support the Planning Commission's recommendation of the 600 feet away from residential. I think that little corner of the business park isn't going to be affected. There's still plenty of room in Area B to put these type of uh, establishments in. So thank you so much. Councilmember Contreras. I really appreciate uh, all the work that staff has put in, um, especially, you know, I mean, it's just been going, it, this conversation has been going on for a very, very, very long time, and um, I'm happy to be looking at some really good direction for our city because, you know, what I'm hearing um, really is that the illegal market 
without having this regulatory framework is causing a lot of issues. And I think we've seen that. Um, you know, adults and those who are uh, seeking cannabis for medical use uh, should have the ability to walk into a store, feel safe there, and uh, be able to speak with individuals who are knowledgeable uh, so that that way they can move forward with the best um, medical use possible for that individual. Um, I do agree with uh, the Planning Commission's recommendation of the 600 feet. Um, and I do appreciate the comments uh, that Deputy Mayor uh, Franklin uh, said. I, I do agree with him. Um, and at this point, I, in looking at the direction uh, that we provided staff and what's come back, uh, I 100% support it. Um, I, I do want to state, though, that when it comes to adult use recreational, uh, that's definitely a conversation uh, that I want to have. Um, because in the same vein of when we're discussing uh, our businesses here that are licensed within this very rigid regulatory framework, uh, being disadvantaged uh, if others are able to deliver here in the city, um, I could see uh, an argument that could be made uh, regarding recreational use as well um, within that line of thought. So uh, personally, uh, that's something that I think we need to discuss as a council, um, but I am 100% in favor uh, of staff's uh, recommendations at this point. Thank you. Councilmember Rigby. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you to everybody who spoke on this issue. I really appreciate hearing from all different sides on this, and I appreciate this uh, report from staff. And as my colleagues have said, you know, we've had multiple discussions on this. We have asked staff to come back with different things for us, and I think what you have provided tonight is what we have asked for. And I think, uh, especially the testing facilities, and I think that we are a great location for testing facilities, regardless of how many there are in other places, I think we should have some here in Vista. So I absolutely approve that, agree with that. Um, I'm always concerned about the vaping, and we've had this conversation about the vaping, the THC and the vaping, um, and people have had positions on both sides of that, but I think that the argument that nobody has died from it is not an argument anymore because there have been so many deaths just in the last couple of months. But that's not something that we can go out into the street and monitor every single solitary person that pulls out a vape to say that can't have THC, you, you, you know, you shouldn't be vaping. But it does make me want to ask the question, because I know in our, in our community we have areas where smoking is prohibited. Um, have we updated our municipal code to include vaping in those same areas? And is that a discussion we want to have, given the fact that some of the things used in these vape devices, you know, if you're using THC on them, I, I, don't, I, I don't vape, I don't smoke. I gave up smoking a long time ago after 15 years, yay me. Um, but I don't vape, so I'm not familiar with how those fumes travel. Um, so I would be curious to know if that is something that we needed to address as well. The city's ordinances um, on the books that prohibit smoking in public places also permit, prohibit e-cigarette products. So vapes would, so vaping covered. would be included, correct. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so I, I agree with uh, the Planning Commission also with a 600 feet um, buffer between homes. And uh, with that, Madam Mayor, I would move to close the public hearing and uh, move that we approve staff's recommendation in items one through six and include the 600 foot buffer as recommended by the Planning Commission. Okay, and I would just say that I agree actually with all of you and all, you have good comments from everybody. And um, my only thing I, and when we say um, like, within 600 feet of residential, those businesses that are there, I want to be sure that they aren't going to do any, re like some of our manufacturers have sales like at Christmas and different, I want to be sure that they aren't, they, 
and they don't sell to retail, but they'll open up and have a sale every now and then. I want to be sure that they don't open up and have a, a sale on that. So that would be, you, you know what I'm saying? I think there's some businesses out there that do like. So that, that would be prohibited under our licensing as well as the state laws, I believe, Mayor, so. No, no sales. No. <laughs> okay, that would be, because I just don't want to be sure that that would not happen. And then also, uh, can, can rec recreational be delivered, like, from the deliveries that come from outside our city, can they deliver recreational into our city or is that against the law? So based on the uh, current regulations on the books through the State Bureau of Cannabis Control, delivery is allowed throughout the state. So a recreational. Adult use and medical. So do they have to be, because on a person you can only have a small amount of marijuana, right? So in a delivery, do they there's have lots certain, of... There's a certain amount. It's larger than a single product, but there's a certain amount that delivery drivers can carry that it is regulated, though. And, and that be, like, licensed by the, the place that, that... In theory, they would be licensed by the legal a retailer from which they are delivering. But, but it could be black market people just delivering. That exists regardless. Yeah, okay, I don't like that, but I support the Planning um, Commission's recommendation and um, I'll second the motion. Yes, Councilmember Green, sorry. Did you want to say uh, that? Yeah, I'm just wondering, do we vote for the moratorium in a separate motion since we need the four or five or is this all in one motion? It's all one motion. Okay, so this includes the moratorium as well. Okay, so please cast your votes. That motion passes unanimously. Did we close the public hearing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll, um, the next thing on our agenda is the public hearing to consider public testimony on the terms of a disposition and development affordable housing agreement with solutions for change in partnership with Kingdom Development. And the public hearing is now open. Assistant City Manager um, Ali Zimmerman will introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with me tonight is our Housing Programs Manager, Amanda Lee. She will be providing the staff report. Hi, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. For your consideration tonight are four interconnected agreements with Solutions for Change in partnership with Kingdom Development, collectively known as the developer, to expand their existing development at 722 California Avenue. Currently, the developer owns or is an escrow to acquire seven parcels on the southwest corner of West California Avenue and West Los Angeles Drive. At the November 19th Planning Commission meeting, the developer received a special use permit, site development plan with bonus density, and a tentative parcel map to consolidate the seven parcels into two parcels and to develop two new apartment buildings with 36 residential units and an empowerment center that permits 60 emergency shelter beds. Due to various uses at the expanded campus and proposed funding sources, the development is being bifurcated into two parcels and projects. Per California state law, the City of Vista's housing funds cannot be allocated towards transitional housing or the development of an emergency shelter. The DDA, the DDA, which includes housing funds and the ground lease, are applicable to Parcel 1. Parcel 1 will consist of two th new three-story residential buildings and 11-space parking units. The buildings will have a total of 36 units, which will include 18 two-bedroom units and 18 three-bedroom units. The units will have restricted incomes and rents for 99 years. Currently, the income levels will range from 32,100 to 50,917 for a family of four, and the rents will range from 533 to 1,213 monthly, depending on family size, income levels, and the number of bedrooms. The primary funding sources to construct Parcel 1 includes 9% tax credits, a loan from the County of San Diego's Housing Trust Fund, and a financial contribution from the Commission. The financial contribution requested from the Commission is $2,700,000. Similar to other Commission DDAs, the Commission's funding will be infused into the project only after the developer has secured tax credits, obtained funding from the County, and renegotiated loan terms with various agencies that are applicable to Parcel 2. The County is expected to announce the awardees of their loan by February 2020. The developer intends to apply for 9% tax credits in March 2020 and will be notified if they have been awarded by June 2020. 
Applications for the 9% tax credits in the San Diego geographic region are highly competitive. Therefore, the DDDA does provide the developer until December 31st, 2021 to secure tax credits and other funding sources. The agreements do establish that the commission will obtain ownership of parcel one. The commission will lease the parcel to the developer and at the end of the lease term, the property and improvements will revert to the commission. The ground lease is fiscal, fiscally neutral to the development. However, it does enhance the commission's ability to exercise any remedies to enforce the DDA, thus better protecting the commission's interest in the development. Parcel two will include the rehabilitation of the developer's existing 33 unit transitional housing development, parking for parcel one and two, amenities for both parcels, and will be redeveloped with an empowerment center that includes 60 bed emergency shelter. The primary funding sources for parcel two will include less competitive 4% tax credits, the county's housing trust fund loan, and assumes that the city of Vista, city of Escondido, San Diego Housing and Community Development, and California Housing and Community Development will renegotiate loan terms valued at $4.3 million. Furthermore, parcel one and two are interconnected in regards to shared uses and funding. The project is infeasible without the other. Lastly, before you tonight is a relocation and replacement plan. To facilitate the proposed development, three du duplexes and a nine unit apartment building will need to be demolished and vacated by the current occupants. Under California redevelopment law, the legislative body must adopt a relocation plan and replacing housing plan prior to the displacement of residential tenants. Affected tenants will be relocated and the relocation costs will be paid by the developer. This concludes staff's presentation. With us tonight is Mark Hipsch, our affordable housing attorney, Paul Mara of KMA Associates, our fiscal consultant, and representatives from Solutions for Change and Kingdom Development. All of us are available to answer any questions. Okay, I have, um, I think, seven speakers here. Do you want to hear the speakers first? Okay. Again, we'll start, um, I'll call three of you at a time. If we'll start with one and then one at the podium and then the other two on the side. Um, it goes Bill DeGlass, followed by Paul Webster, followed by James Martell. Good evening, thanks. Um, first of all, I'm a, I've been a resident of VISTA for three years, and this is my very first uh, council meeting. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I came here because um, I'm a recent volunteer for Solutions for Change. I work in their business office, and I had the luxury of um, only having to work part-time now for a consulting firm. So I have, in the past, um, volunteered for many other organizations like Ronald Donald House, Feeding America, Amakasa, um, various other things. I've never been associated with such a great organization um, as Solutions for Change. And um, it's meaningful to me. Um, I had a brother that was homeless for um, several years, actually. And I see here in this organization something very different. It's not just a sheltering and feeding organization. It's one that transforms lives. And they've been successful, very successful, at being able to get them back on their feet, being productive, and contributing to society. And so I believe in that very much. Um, I wish it uh, was available to my brother in another state. So um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Paul Webster, followed by James Martell, followed by Leanne Twig. Well, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. And by the way, Merry Christmas. Uh, Solutions for Change just celebrated its 20th anniversary of serving VISTA, providing housing to homeless families and children, and providing employment, training, education, and life transformation. The item being considered tonight will move Solutions for Change expansion forward to provide more affordable housing, more facilities to educate and empower, and more opportunities to move homeless families off the streets. I would urge your support because it creates more affordable housing and will update and expand a community asset. As you know, I've been following the council's work on the Homeless Action Plan. And the good news is, 
We don't need to hire any additional consultants. You don't need any other additional investment because we've got a great homelessness prevention and solution right here in Vista that just needs your support to expand it to serve more families and help get more kids off the street. As I've also mentioned before, Solutions for Change housing has a demonstrated impact of reducing crime. Our Vista Terrace property was once the single most called on address in the city by the sheriffs, for the sheriffs. Now the sheriff's own data show an 80% decrease in crime at Vista Terrace. Also, Solutions for Change has a 100% rate of child and family reunification. That saves taxpayer money spent on CPS and prevents the next generation of homelessness. It's a wonderful prevention strategy. Therefore, I urge the council to approve the agreement so that the city can increase its amount of affordable housing, we can improve the neighborhood in District 1, and we can expand an effective homelessness prevention program and a homelessness solution here in the city of Vista. Please support this agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, James Martell, followed by Leanne Twig, followed by Tina Faison. Good evening, everyone. My name is James Martell. I've resided in Vista for 15 years now, and I now live at Solutions for Change. The reason I'm here is I'd like you to know how much this program's impacted my life. I've changed my ways completely, and I've been to 13 other programs, and this program by far just blows me away. It's just amazing to see the people grow around you and just the family and the camaraderie that we have there. And the reason I'm asking you to please accept this proposal is so I could be there to give back and just let other people in our community receive what I've received and just be there to help and see our, our community grow, especially for the families. Thank you. Thank you. Leanne Twig, followed by Atina Fiesan, and by, followed by Monica, oh dear, Karichian. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leanne Twig, and um, I'm not a fancy speaker, but I am a program member of Solutions for Change. I came in homeless and I'm almost graduated. I've been there for two and a half years and I have to say that going from nothing to almost having enough money in my savings to buy my own home is where I'm at right now. So I've gone through all the different things that they needed me to do and I have become such a success by this thousand day program that they've offered to me and I know that so many other people can do it too. I mean, I'm so proud of myself and my family and my neighbors and what it has offered to me. And, you know, I, I would never thought that I would be where I am today. And it's, it's an amazing transformation. So thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Tina? And then followed by Monica. Hello, my name is Tina Faison, and I'm a resident of Avista and a graduate from Solution for Change. I urge the council to vote yes on the agreement between the city of Avista and Solution for Change for affordable housing and to expand the Solution for Change campus. I support this agreement because I have benefited from Solutions for Change program. It has helped me address the challenges in my life that led me to homelessness, incarceration, and substance abuse. Instead of someone running around the streets, getting in trouble and taking from the public, I am now um, employed and have my children back in my custody. I pay rent and I, benefit, and I contribute to the community. The agreement between the city and Solutions for Change will create more housing for families like mine and more facilities to serve parents and kids who are living on the streets in their cars or doubling up in bad living conditions. Housing is important and this agreement will help create more affordable housing, but not just for me, but for other families. It's more than just a roof over my head. It is creating a supportive community that helps people overcome their challenges and permanently solve those issues that led to homelessness. I urge you to approve the agreement to create more housing and support more families experiencing homeless and vista as myself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Monica. Hello, I'm Monica Karechian, and I have been a volunteer at Solutions for the last few months, and I'm just so impressed with all that they're doing. I've helped in the office, I've helped in the kids' zone, and then also on the farm, and the farm is amazing. The whole everything about it, it's just the, um, the residents there as well as the people that work there. It's the community is amazing, and I'm just 
so happy that there's something like this around for our the homeless community um, so that they have a chance to get off the street and improve their lives. And the thousand day program is just um, to be able to get off aid of the government is awesome. So I hope you guys um, agree to this. Thank you. Thank you. That's our last speaker. So I'll turn it over to Deputy Mayor Franklin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Lee, who has done uh, an enormous amount of work, and all of our staff uh, who have put a lot of hours into this. Um, and I also want to thank uh, our partners at Solutions uh, for all the, the effort that they've put into this and all that they're doing, uh, which is really powerful in our community. Um, I, I think this is such an important project. Uh, we've invested in a number of housing uh, projects um, during my time on the council and immediately prior to my time on the council, this is the only one that I am just truly feel good about because uh, the, the word that we kept hearing uh, from our speakers tonight is community. And when you go to the, uh, when you go to solutions and you go to the housing units, uh, that they are currently owned and operating in the city of Vista, you see the community. You see some of the cleanest uh, apartment communities that exist in our city, and that is really impressive. Uh, there is accountability, uh, not only to the program, but also to one another, and there is a reduction, uh, a total reduction, almost elimination in calls for service by the sheriff. Uh, which is not what we've seen in some of our other attempts uh, at housing projects. So when I look at the cost-benefit analysis of investing uh, you know, with a, a, a partner like Solutions, um, I just think that's so important. Um, it's, uh, it's about sustainability. It's about changing lives. It's about restoring dignity. Uh, we heard from some of the folks. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. It's really powerful. Uh, and really helps us understand the value of what we're doing. We're really great, grateful for you. Uh, we know that's tough to do. Um, I, I think one of the things that's so important about this agreement itself is, uh, like we do with our other housing agreements, uh, we will eventually be the, the owners of the land. Um, this gives us a lot of ability uh, to, it's, it's not just a, a handshake and we're done. This is a partnership for 99 years. <laughs> it's a long-term partnership. Um, homelessness is something that the council elevated to be one of its highest goals. We're spending a lot of time talking about making a difference in homelessness right now. Um, I'm really a, a fan of solutions and their approach to restoring dignity and rebuilding a person, uh, teaching them to fish. I always talk about uh, rather than, uh, like I like to say, throwing a fish and, and hitting them in the head and hoping it finds them well. Uh, I think it's so important to have this uh, holistic approach um, and to really help people uh, restore themselves, uh, and not just not just provide the services, but provide the community that goes with it. So um, really happy uh, to be at this point after several years of work on this project. And um, I want to I want to go ahead and offer uh, that we accept the DDA that's been negotiated and um, approve it. And is that all that we need is a motion to approve the uh, DDA? If, if there's, the staff recommendation is on the table. If you desire to make a motion to adopt the staff recommendation, that would be sufficient. There's five different things. Okay, uh, yeah, open and, and close the public hearing, uh, adopt the council resolution, uh, several resolutions. Uh, I will, uh, staff recommendation, yeah, maybe? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll move uh, approval of staff. <laughs> this is quite a lengthy, uh, it's, a, it's the first time we've had about a 600 page agreement uh, in a while. So, yeah, I will approve the, uh, the formally written, uh, or I'll, I'll move that we approve the, uh, the written recommendation of staff uh, as listed in the agenda. Councilmember Contreras. <laughs> Thank you so much, staff, Amanda, for uh, tireless work, uh, you know, 
helping Solutions for Change get to the point that we're at right now. You know, I have been a 100% uh, in lockstep with Solutions uh, for Change up until this moment. Um, you know, I, I do have a concern because we're, we're discussing what a good partnership it is. Um, however, uh, last council meeting, I was a little bit disturbed to hear uh, one of the representatives from Solutions for Change state that municipalities are wasting their money uh, in pursuing solutions for homelessness. So, it, you know, it almost makes it seem as though the $2.7 million or whatever the case might be or the 150000 that was provided to Solutions uh, prior to me being on council, you know, it, words like that make it seem as though if we provide funding or grants to any other organizations outside of Solutions for Change, it's frowned upon, right? So what I just want to make sure is that as a 501c3, that what is pursued is within the purview of a 501c3. You know, I'm, I don't, I'm not a big fan of inserting ideological uh, perspectives. Um, and so, you know, I want to take what is said at face value, which really puts me in conflict because if, if that is held true, um, and it was stated that all this money that municipalities are providing is wasted, uh, I have a real concern with that, um, especially when we're looking at two point. Uh, seven million dollars that we're going to be allocating because, you know, when I hear words like that, I look at my constituents, I look at, you know, the residents here in the city of Vista, and people work really hard for us to be able to have this public money so that we can do something really good with it. So up until this point, you know, I have been lockstep in support of your organization, uh, but I am really concerned when I hear verbiage like that because, I just don't think that's the right approach to take in it. And it's something that I have personally, in, in behind closed doors, uh, when I met uh, with individuals at Solutions for Change, I a long time ago said, hey, you know what, I, I just don't want to hear this type of um, commentary. I don't think that... Uh, you know, saying something like that and then requesting $2.7 million from the city, I just don't see that as a compatible relationship. Uh, so, you know, I was 100% in favor of this, um, but I'm, I'm starting to question uh, whether or not the partnership uh, can, can move forward if these are the types of comments that are, you know, being made when y'all are thinking about, you know, how to talk to council. So I just want, want to make it very clear uh, that I really hope you don't think that municipalities are wasting money when pursuing different solutions to address the homeless uh, crisis that we have uh, here in the state, here in the city. Uh, so... I'm, I'm on the fence right now, to be honest with you, because of the comments that were said at the last council meeting. So I would just like to hear, you know, more from my colleagues and see where I end up landing on this one. Councilmember Green. All right. Um, I definitely understand there's no, you know, one solution to homelessness, but I do definitely think that the Solutions for Change approach is a fantastic solution uh, for change, hence the name, Solutions for Change. Um, but I think that uh, we obviously are going to invest our money in other areas as well, and I think that you guys would support us so in, in, you know, investing in other areas. Uh, but in looking at this project and in looking at Solutions for Change, my first experience with Solutions for Change was as a PTA dad. I have four kids and we go to Beaumont Elementary School here in Vista right around the corner and you guys have an aquaponics farm and we were looking at doing a farm to fork program and Vista Unified School District actually partnered with uh, Solutions for Change and you guys did have a farm to fork program. Uh, some of us PTA got to go tour your aquaponics farm and right now there's actually a science garden at Beaumont Elementary School that grows food that they serve in their cafeteria and that's something that I would have never known about had we not had this partnership with Solutions for Change where they come into schools and I also did a uh, career day with Vista Magnet 
middle school where you showed them how to do your aquaponics farm and they set up a whole aquaponics uh, you know, farm thing. And the only reason why I bring that out is because you're not required to do that as a homeless shelter. You're not required to partner with the community. You're not required to show elementary schools and middle schools what you do and how you do it and educate. But that's something that Solutions for Change does that other organizations uh, don't go the extra mile to do. And that's something that I really appreciate. The other thing that I appreciate is math. Um, I'm a big fan of math. And I always say it's not magic, it's math. And when you look at the numbers, this facility costs $43,311,000. Our investment at the City of Vista, and mind you, our $2.7 million investment has 598 pages of strings to go along with it, um, which is a lot of stuff you have to do. But what I see when I look at these numbers is that if I give you $2.7 million, you're going to provide a service to my community, 36 affordable units that we highly, highly need, not only for our arena numbers, but also for our community. Um, and I also see that at the end of our 99-year partnership, guess who owns a $43 million piece of land? the city of Vista. So when I look at investing our money and what's a good investment for my community and organizations that I work with, I feel like this particular item that I have in front of me is a fantastic benefit for my city. Um, I, I love the stories of life's changed. Uh, I know we're not, nobody's going to have a 100% success story, but I haven't had anybody come up and say, hey, Solutions for Change is horrible and they're lying about everything. And when you've been in business for as long as you guys have been in business and changing lives and affecting lives for as long as you've been in business, to not have that counter you know, culture per se against you regularly is huge. And in my opinion, it means you're doing something right. So as a council member and as somebody who has benefited from you throughout my school district, throughout my community, um, and as a businessman, I look at this as something that's positive for the city. So I, with that, I uh, would also like to second the motion to close the public hearing and accept all recommendations listed in the staff report. Thank you. Councilmember Rigby. Thank you, Madam Mayor. First, I do want to say thank you to everybody who came out tonight to speak uh, on this issue. I appreciate hearing everything that you say. And I, I do absolutely recognize the value that Solutions has had on the community. And I appreciate Mr. Webster. I lost track of where you went to. But I appreciate your comments earlier when you said that uh, we don't need to go anywhere else because you have all the programs to help everything. I appreciate you, you, you said, you know, we didn't need to pull other things in, but actually we do um, because solutions doesn't help all of the demographics of the homeless that we have in our community. So I still recognize that as, as good as the community is behind solutions, we do still have other things. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Um, our homeless population has increased over the years. Uh, we need to work harder on working with our homeless population and all the demographics. And Solutions does not serve all of the demographics in our homeless population. Um, out of our 598 page agenda report, there was something in here that I, I don't know if we have an answer to. On page five, third, um, let me see, go with page five. In addition to the commission loans, Solutions for Change received loans totaling $3,553,312 from the City of Escondido, the San Diego Housing and Community Development, and the California Housing and Community Development. For the entire development to proceed, since both projects are interdependent, the developer must either negotiate to extend, restructure, eliminate, or modify their current loan obligations. The restructure of the loans provides assurances to the investors that there are no near-term accelerations and or scheduled debt service payments that would interfere with the projected cash flow reflected in the pro forma. At this time, staff has not received confirmation that the other identified agencies have agreed to the new loans. Do we know why we have not received this information? Some, I know Escondido was waiting for the City of Vista to complete the development before they move forward. I mean, the performa, so we did submit the performa to them. With the other two agencies, um, which is the State of California and the county, I'm not, I would have to defer to solutions about where they're at with that particular status. So my question is, my second question mm -hmm. on this, 
for this to go forward, we need to have this item, and we don't have it. And this has been an issue with solutions in the past when we've tried to do things and not had all of all of the ducks in a row, all the, all the boxes checked. So if we don't have what we need for this to go forward, why are we having this discussion right now? Well, there are a lot of times with most of our DDAs, um, our developers need additional steps. Um, our money is usually infused. Our, the negotiation is infused up front, but then our money is put in way later, as you can tell from the staff report. But like 9% tax credits are not usually provided before we negotiate the terms. Um, this is a little bit more different than any other project that we've gone through. We haven't had this many different funding sources going in where there has to be this many different negotiations. Um, but at this particular time, for them to be able to go in and be proactive with getting other funding sources, they did need a commitment from the city to have some little portion um, financially contributed. Okay. But we still anticipate... Yeah, the project cannot, the, at this point, what we're doing with the DDA is we're reserving the $2.7 million for Solutions for Change. They have until December 21st, 2020 to be able to secure all the other funding sources. 2021, I'm sorry. Um, if they do not secure the other funding sources by that particular time, then, you know, then the, the DDA is over and the money will not be infused into the project. Okay, we'll keep a close eye on that one. Um, I'm going to back up to page three uh, regarding the parking um, on this. And I understand the state of California has their rules and what we can and cannot do for parking. Um, but the parking for this project, I'm just going to say this in my out loud voice, is wholly inadequate. Um, even though the state allows it, uh, mass transit, contrary to what the state wants or Sandag wants us to believe mass transit is not the chosen choice of transportation for a great majority of the population, which is why ridership never goes over 4% of the population. It doesn't increase, it rotates. Studies have shown repeatedly that when people have access to a car, they save their money, they're able to get a car, they do, and they're off public transit. So the ridership of trans transit rotates. It's, it's a revolving door. It doesn't increase ridership. So having this next to the transit center, I appreciate that the state likes that and doesn't require parking. But the reality of what we face already in our city is that developments that don't have adequate parking for the development, contrary or regardless of what the state or Sandag or anybody says, they're still going to have cars, and they're going to be pushing out their parking into the communities around them, into the neighborhoods. And that creates a lot of problems for us throughout our city. We get complaints on it almost every single day. So I, even though, and I understand that you're trying to work this project and how it works best for you land-wise and usage-wise, but with the parking and the problems that we already have in the community that we're talking about all the time, I'm disappointed that you would go with the minimum number of parking required in a community that shows such grace and love to the organization. So I was just hoping that you would do a little bit more on the parking. But I understand that you don't have to. Um, so on my next question, what did I, do? I, ha I have several pages of notes. Please bear with me. On page 189 of staff report, it says that this is the whole section on um, management of the rental project that starts on page 186. But if you flip over to page 189, um, one of the items that is talked about in the management of the rental project is gross mismanagement. And it says during the required covenant period and in the event of gross mismanagement, and there are several things that are defined, of the development, the executive director shall have and retain the authority to direct and require any condition, act, or inactions of gross mismanagement to cease or to be corrected. And it goes on and on, and then it lists out some things. And 
under that heading, subsection I, says fraud or embezzlement of development funds, including without limitation to funds in development funds in the reserve accounts. So I was wondering what other funds, because it seems to me if we're going to have an issue with somebody committing fraud and embezzlement, I would have an issue with them committing fraud or, or embezzlement with any of the monies that they've been given, not just monies in the development fund. Am I missing a disconnect here? No, you're not missing a disconnect. This is fairly standard language that you would see in all DDAs where the city is retaining the property and therefore, along with our infusion of funding, we also have a lot of other controls. Um, this language is, is standard and was negotiated between the city, the commission, and the developer, but it, it's standard language. So that, and I appreciate that. I just think I don't care what money they're embezzling or having fraud with, I'd have an issue with that. So I don't know if we can clarify that language to clean it up a little bit. Um, I wouldn't want it to say that only if they had bad behavior with the money that the city of Vista itself put into it, um, because if they're having bad behavior on any level, it speaks to the whole project and the whole thing. So that just, that just stood out for me there. Um, Councilwoman, if I might, yes. the money that we're putting in is for the development aspect of it, right. not necessarily the operations and maintenance, and that's why it's spelled out for the development money, because that's where we have skin in the game. I, I understand that. I'm just, it just seems to me if there's any fraud or embezzlement on any level, we should have some serious reservations and step back from the project at all. I wouldn't want it just to be identified if they had bad behavior with this pot of money because it affected us. I think if there's bad behavior, it affects the whole project and, and us, no matter where, where pot, what the pot of money is. Um, there are a lot of other comments out of 598 pages. Um, but I agree with my colleague about the comment that was made. There have been some comments made behind the scenes that don't always marry up with the public face and the public ask. And that's always of concern for me. So thank you. Deputy Mayor Franklin. Well, I kind of wanted to elaborate on the concept of the land ownership and why that's important. Because I, I touted it, but I didn't kind of say why it's important. It does give us the ability to uh, demand accountability in the management of the project, and it gives uh, I always say I look at things from a, at least a 40-year perspective. Um, I hope to be here in 40 years. Uh, I, I know I won't be serving on the council in 40 years, but I want to look back at decisions that we made and be really proud of the things that we did. Uh, I want to see developments uh, in neighborhoods that we approved uh, really succeeding. And uh, there is always, you know, there's always a question uh, about housing projects and whether they'll be well maintained into the future. And that's why I think it's so important uh, that we will retain the kinds of, of safeguards and controls. Uh, is it will give future uh, administration here at the city and future councils the ability to demand uh, accountability from from future uh, managers at Solutions. And uh, if the project changes hands, it gives us a lot of a, a lot of power uh, to demand good behavior. The way this uh, development agreement is structured. Our, our money would be the last money in, isn't that right? Yes, that is correct. So what we're really doing here is uh, reserving our funds, and uh, the, you know, the onus is, is uh, on Chris and his team at Solutions to go out and secure the rest of the funding, but, uh, but our promise to reserve these funds and our promise to contribute them uh, after a, a, a negotiated set of, of uh, terms has occurred uh, is what's going to give them ultimately the ability to go out and negotiate uh, for investments from others. So it's really critical to the project. Um, one of the other things that hadn't been mentioned yet is um, in one of the genesis of, of where we're at tonight uh, is uh, Chris came before us, uh, I, I don't know, it was a, a year or two years ago now, It's uh, and wanted to expand uh, the, and kind of build this project at the location on Vista Way, uh, which is uh, in District 1. 
And um, we, uh, at the time, were very, uh, we, the council did not look favorably on that proposal. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, we hope to achieve is, and, and is required, I believe, by this agreement, is, it, is uh, that Solutions would, uh, would sell that property. And uh, I know we had at least uh, one gentleman in the room tonight that was uh, thinking about uh, some commercial development there. Um, we have a very real opportunity in front of us to have a, a redevelopment uh, in District 1 that is desperately needed. And I think that's a really important uh, part of this as well. Uh, I think would uh, would really, and it's right on the district line with District 2. Uh, so it, it'll benefit uh, uh, residents there in, in the north part of the city with new jobs uh, and a, a cleaner appearance. Uh, get that old uh, city hall building of ours that's almost right on the, the sidewalk. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to approve something with a little bit more setback and something that'll really be a benefit to the community there. And that's something that we'll accomplish by moving this agreement forward. And um, only because uh, we're not giving them another opportunity to speak for themselves, uh, I, I, I just wanted to say on their behalf, I, I think, I think uh, what I heard in some of the comments that, that you referenced uh, was more a, uh, a feeling of which way is best. Um, to invest in to help people. Uh, and certainly we have, all of us, a lot of disagreement about which way is best to help people. Uh, there's no question about that. Good, good, honest people disagree about the right way to, to help people. Uh, the one thing we can all agree on is that we all do want to help people. And when it comes to this problem, because I truly feel that the correct uh, magic bullet solution doesn't exist, uh, when a, you talk about a problem as big as homelessness, all the solutions have to be on the table, and they all have to be discussed. Uh, and we won't agree uh, on all of them, but um, the thing that I know about this particular program is uh, there are people who are uh, really investing a lot of their time uh, on a volunteer basis, even those people who are staff members. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've known a lot of them for a long time, and I know that if they chose, uh, they would have great opportunities in the private sector, but they're their heart and their passion is, is in helping people and, and helping the kids uh, that get help by this program. And so, you know, that's one thing I've always been passionate about is preserving the purview of people who uh, make their career, uh, they give their time and their passion to something that they feel is changing the world. Uh, that's where I really want to free those people to do it their way because if you take from them the ability to do it their way, uh, it diminishes their feeling that they're they're doing something and that, and their belief that it's getting done things done the right way. But uh, I, you know, like I said, all the solutions have to be on the table. They all have to be discussed, and they all have to be given a fair hearing uh, and and be approached with an open mind and an open heart. Um, but uh, despite uh, whatever missteps uh, in rhetoric they may have had, uh, I just. I want you to think, uh, please, about the, the kids that, that uh, will be helped, that will live in this facility, and, uh, and, and I know we'll all feel good that we were a small part of, of making that happen because uh, there are families that, you know, these facilities will change their lives, and I think we're going to feel really good about that. So um, I would just ask um, a little bit of uh, maybe forgiveness uh, for you know, for zeal and exuberance, uh, and um, and I, I hope you would support the project. To get back to the project, I will make a couple of comments here. <laughs> so um, th there's a lot of moving parts to this project, and there's a lot, a lot of the loans and the grants depend on our city approval. We're the very first to, to get in there, and once we give our approval, they still have a lot to go through on this project, a lot of, a lot of different grants and things. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to support um, the planning, rec planning Commission recommendation. But, and as far as the parking goes, I, I noticed in here that the development requires 78 parking spaces, 78. But they're doing 108 surface parking spaces, which I agree aren't enough. But the, the state has changed the, the affordable housing rules. And so they, um, anything within a half a mile of the transit, you know, they can reduce the parking requirements um, to a half of a space per bedroom. So 
and they're actually doing more than they, they have to do. But I, I agree with you, uh, council member, <laughs> that, that um, I always like more parking because I think the parking always overflows onto the street and there's no parking on the street there. And so I, I agree that it's going to be short parking, but I, I, I think the state has taken that, that away from us. So anyway, so I want to thank Amanda. You've done, I know you've done a lot on this project and work a lot of hours on this project. And so um, I want to thank you for all the time you put in on it. And um, with that, I will call on council member Contreras. Thank you. I really appreciate having this type of discussion. You know, like I said, I was lockstep uh, in favor of this project as it's been before me. And I was in the audience, uh, not a council member, but in the audience when uh, the East Vista Way project was uh, discussed. And so, and, and I know we have a serious crisis in our community with homelessness. And you know, I, I recently had a panel on youth and young adult homelessness, and one of the, the big asks was, you know, we need to have more shelters for families as well. Um, again, to kind of echo uh, Council Member Rigby, it, it is not the only solution, um, or else we would have seen a decrease, significant decrease in our homeless population here in Vista. Um, with all the great work that Solutions for Change has done. Uh, but I am really concerned because this is, it's not just one instance of this type of rhetoric, it is ongoing. And so I just wanna make it very clear that in the world of a 501c3, when you're asking a body, city council, to help partner up with you and you're requesting millions of dollars that you know, there's some kind of recognition of the partnership and the fact that this program is not the only thing that can be invested in to decrease the amount of housing and security that we have in our community. So I just wanna make that very clear. Um, but I do understand the need for it. And this is in District 1. And that corner of you know West Los, uh, West Los Angeles, West California, it needs some help with pedestrian uh, safety improvements. Um, but you know, there's also the fact that we have to remove X amount of people from there. Okay, it's getting them placed somewhere else. There's funding for that. I get that. But this is so involved in. I understand that we need to, if Solutions is going to move forward um, with this very complicated project, that you know we have to say yes to it. I don't want to be someone who says no to more uh, shelter because I have been up here, you know, <laughs> advocating very uh, hard for a, a good tool set for our city to have. Right, different solutions. Um, what I would ask is that for organizations that are, you know, continuously requesting support uh, so that they can grow uh, their successful programs, that there is a recognition that they are not the only ones in this ecosystem of solutions. Okay, so I just want to make that very clear because if I continue to hear this, I, I'm going to continue to question whether the partnership is a good one or not, if it's a good fit or not. So, um, but you know, I've been out to the farm. I think it's fantastic. I've had good conversations with uh, Mr. Megason and Mr. Webster, but I've also been very clear about where I stand when it comes to the way that uh, other programs are characterized. Um, I, I, I just don't think that we need to even go there. We can just focus on what good the organization is doing and um, not add some of these other things that might be more appropriate for a 501c4. Um, so, I again, I really appreciate this discussion and this is, this is a tough one for me um, because my value system is such that I'm like, yeah, we need more. We need more here in the city of Vista to help our families that are struggling. Um, I do have a question regarding, uh, you know, since this is gonna be drawn out a little bit further, 
Um, how much how much is it that the city has invested in staff time or funds uh, for us to get to this point right now? Approximately a hundred thousand dollars. So a hundred thousand dollars. So again, I just want to belabor the point that we need to ensure that the ecosystem of solutions, which Solutions for Change is a, is a really, you know, big part of that, but it's not the only thing. And we have already invested about $100,000 just to get to this point. So I think the city has been a great partner, and I just want to make sure that's reciprocated. Thank you. Okay, so we have, I see no more speakers, so we have a motion and a second, so I'll ask you to please cast your votes. That motion passes with one no vote. With that, we have move on to our discussion items, and we have two discussion items this evening. Um, the first one is the appointment of a deputy mayor. The first item is mayor. the appointment of a deputy. Oh, we did? I forgot one? Oh, dang. <laughs> I must have put it away unconsciously. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> but I'm not in a hurry or anything. It's public hearing two. Here it is. Public hearing three. This public hearing has received public comment on the city's 2018 regional transport. Wait, everybody. Okay. Okay. We'll start over here. This public hearing has received public comment on the city's 2018 Regional Transportation Improvement Program Amendment Number 9. Public hearing is now open. Assistant City Manager Ali Zimmerman will introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor. Our Senior Management Analyst Sarah Taylor will present the staff report. Sorry. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. This report is on the Ninth Amendment to the 2018 Regional Transportation Improvement Program, known as the RTIP. The RTIP is SANDAG's program that includes proposed projects for transit improvement in the San Diego region, including projects that are eligible for the TransNet funding. TransNet is the countywide voter-approved half-cent sales tax distributed to local agencies based on population and miles maintained. SANDAG uses the RTIP similar to how we use our, budget, our CAP budget document. There are two VISTA projects that are included in this Ninth Amendment to the RTIP. This slide shows the TransNet programming changes for these projects. Um, this amendment aligns our RTIP programming for these projects with the five-year capital improvement program budget and City A Council approved budget amendments. SANDAG requires each local agency to hold a public hearing for transnet programming changes and for a resolution to be approved by the City Council for each amendment before any updates to the RTIP are accepted. This concludes my presentation. We are available to answer any questions. Councilman Berigby. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I want to say thank you for, the, for this, and I would move that we close the public hearing and adopt the resolution approving the amendment to the Transnet Local Street Improvement Program for projects for fiscal years 2019 through 2023. Before we go on, I, I have a speaker. So, Matt. Uh, thank you, Mayor, City uh, Manager. Um, yeah, that um, presentation wasn't much to go on, um, to be honest. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to revert back to, you know, what I was talking about earlier. Um, just those of you who are on the, the transportation boards, um, just to sort of to take those and, and fight as hard as you can for Vista. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Green. I'd just like to second uh, Council Member Rigby's motion to close the public hearing and accept the staff's recommendations. Okay, seeing no more speakers, I ask you to cast your votes. That motion passes unanimously. And okay, now I think we go to discussion items, right? <laughs> now I'm going to, okay, there's two discussion items this evening. The first one is D1 is the appointment of a deputy mayor. Um, 
the first item is to appoint a deputy mayor for a one-year term. So um, let's open for nominations from our council. Councilmember Green. Uh, I move that Deputy Mayor for the 2020-2021 year be uh, Deputy Mayor Amanda Rigby. Okay, do you have a second for that? Let's second that. Okay, um, seeing no other discussion, i um, ask you to do vote. We vote, right? Yes, yes. cast your votes. <laughs> that motion passes unanimously. So congratulations, Councilmember Rigby, Deputy Mayor Rigby. I got to I got to change my 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 wording here. <laughs> okay. So the next thing is um, item D two is community gardens and biodiversity hotspots. Councilmember Contreras asked for this item to be put on the agenda, so I'll ask her to introduce the item. All right. You know, I really appreciate uh, everybody who's here um, to take a look at this, this item. Let me pull it up. Now, the, the one thing that I just want to say is I have heard from people all over the city, every single district, how much they want community gardens. What I haven't heard is a discussion about it. Um, so... First and foremost, I want to allow the public the opportunity to let us know what their ideas are. Uh, and also for us as a city to share what some possible obstacles are uh, and take a look at, you know, if we can overcome any of those obstacles. And if not, uh, that's why I added the concept of biodiversity hotspots. Uh, so just uh, to define community garden uh, so that way we're all on the same level here. Uh, I, I thought the CDC had a really good uh, definition. So community gardens are collaborative projects on shared open spaces where participants share in the maintenance and products of the garden, including healthful and affordable fresh fruits and vegetables. Gardens may offer physical and mental health benefits by providing opportunities to eat healthy, fresh fruits and vegetables, engage in physical activity, skill building, and creating green space, beautify vacant lots, which I think, you know, driving around Vista, walking around Vista, we definitely see the potential for beautification, and that is one of our council goals. Revitalize communities and industrial areas revive and beautify public parks, create green rooftops. That one might be a little bit of a stretch, unless maybe we want to do it here somehow. <laughs> um, decrease violence in some neighbor neighborhoods and improve social well-being through strengthen strengthening social connections. Okay, so when I'm talking about community garden, that's what I'm looking at. That's the picture that I'm painting. Uh, now, biodiversity hotspots, there is actually a definition for it. I didn't want to be pretentious and make my own definition, but the definition is on a macro scale, and we're really looking at a mi micro scale here, just at the city level, not you know this huge bio region of multiple countries or whatever the case might be. Uh, so I define biodiversity hotspots as the purposeful planting of California native plants and other site-suitable plants that provide native and migratory species the opportunity to forage and thrive in an increasingly urbanized environment, which that last part, uh, increasingly urbanized environment, is something that we see here in the city, right? We're uh, becoming more dense. Uh, we're seeing a reduction of open space. Um, you know, and, and when open space is on private land, well, I mean, there's not so much we can do, right? Property owners have rights that we need to respect. However, uh, we do have a considerable amount, whether we look at, you know, small little strip or a bigger parcel, uh, but we do have, uh, as public land, uh, the opportunity to not have to even purchase uh, additional property 
uh, to either pursue a community garden or if that is too difficult to do for whichever reason, uh, we have you know, the ability to at least make this vacant lot look nicer. Uh, when we're talking about site suitable plants, we're looking at California natives that are drought tolerant. Uh, you know, we are blessed uh, here in San Diego County to have a ton of different microclimates here in the city of Vista, the climactic wonderland. Uh, there is no um, reason why uh, we cannot beautify our city uh, with either implementing a community garden component and or a biodiversity hotspot component. Um, you know, one of the things that I see, uh, we have a really small city, right? Like 18 square miles, big population. Uh, why are people going to come to Vista? We've always talked about, and I've heard, uh, you know, Vista is a destination city or we want it to become a destination city. Well, I can tell you one thing, that people will be coming to Vista to see biodiversity hotspots. Um, I know that because, believe it or not, birding, which is going out and looking for birds, right? Uh, it's actually one of the biggest pastimes uh, here in the United States. We have uh, the Audubon, um, which is on county land, I believe, you know, and they see people going out birding. Um, I mean, you could, we could literally think of having a city of birding and brews, <laughs> you know? I mean, why, why are we not thinking about how to, um, how to kind of overlay beautification with biodiversity, with, you know, the businesses that we have here, uh, and uh, with the attraction that nature itself brings, um, especially in, in such an active area like San Diego County. Uh, you know, people are out as much as they can. Uh, they're out physically exercising, going on, on hikes. Um, so, I want to leave it up for discussion and if there are any uh, individuals who want to speak on it. Um, but I would like to hear your thoughts. I have several speakers. So. Perfect. I, I would love to hear the speakers and then okay. hear from my colleagues. So we'll do the same thing. One, one person at the thing and two of you over her standing on the side. So we'll start with um, Sharon. Oh dear. I got my... Looks like um, Abistiki. Okay, and, and followed by Kathleen Boyle and Mary Jo Poole. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. Uh, you already know I'm Sharon Albistegui. <laughs> uh, I want to speak on behalf of, of the community gardens. When I lived in Santa Monica for many, many years, there was a huge community garden on the border between Santa Monica and West LA, Ocean View Farms. And I was a participant in that garden for more than 12 years. And I can't tell you the wonderful benefits to both communities and to all the individuals and families and children. Children today, you've read books, I'm sure, on nature deprivation for children. Families would have their gardens there and they would bring their children and they'd be pushing them around in the wheelbarrows while they were, the gardens would make their own compost and the kids would help us wheel the wheelbarrows over there to collect the compost. And, and the, uh, the garden was uh, leased, the land was leased from the city and the uh, members would pay for our water and our garden keys so other people couldn't come into the garden and, and raid our, our patches or anything like that. But it would be on an annual fee, uh, and it was, uh, it was nominal. Uh, we had an executive committee to handle complaints among gardens, gardeners, and also to uh, discuss things that uh, needed to be attended to in the garden. People would pay uh, in labor 
for the, the paths, to keep the paths clean, to work in the uh, compost, because the city would donate uh, manure from the uh, mounted horse uh, community, you know, the mounted horse police that would be in the parades and all of that stuff. So we got their manure, but that had to be mixed with other organic material, and so there would be committees that once a month would work in the uh, gardens to clear the paths, work on the, the compost. Uh, monthly there would be a potluck where we could discuss anything that needed to be done. There would be a place where we could exchange plants and seeds. And uh, we had an orchard. People could also pay uh, their service dues working in the orchard. We had two orchards. We even had a big old macadamia tree. I don't know if anybody could crack the nuts, but we had them. <laughs> and and uh, I worked a lot in the orchard, so we had fruit. And uh, people from all of the members of the community could partake of the fruit, a hand, two hands full at a time. That was all that they were allowed, so that everyone had a chance to have fruit from our own trees. And uh, we had speakers come to, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Kathleen Boyle, followed by Mary Jo Poole, followed by Piola Elis. Hi, Elis. good evening. I'm going to do my own timing, too. I used to live near that garden and drove by it almost every day, and it was up on a hill a little bit. And no matter what time of year, there was always, of course, something different going on. It was always great to see the plots and how some people kept those they're doing this, and other people had different things. So. Okay, um, so in addition to nutrition, um, community gardens have a long history of helping in many other ways. When I was in graduate school many years ago, one of my colleagues was a vet with PTSD, and he used to go, I was at UCLA, so the West LA VA was near us. He used to go over there for stuff, services, and they had their own garden. It was kind of like a hobby garden. And he realized that, and so he was doing that, and he realized, his PTSD was so much better. He actually was part of a pilot program. I can't say he started it, but he was part of a pilot program for vets with PTSD to do gardening, and it had great success. And there's a whole line of research. I just looked up quickly tonight. Ten reasons why gardening, especially community gardening, is good. Some of these are not what you'd think about, or I didn't think about, practicing acceptance which I know as a horribly failed gardener, like, ah, killed another one. Um, so practicing acceptance and kind of learning, moving beyond perfectionism, social benefits of a community garden, connecting to the natural world. So you have to be away. We are more, I think, I think here maybe more so than in bigger cities or places like LA, we're more in, in touch with our natural world, but still, like, where is the sun coming during the winter? Is it going to hit that patch of ground? Oh, no, it's not. So getting your hands in the dirt, what is the rain cycle? The Japanese have an expression, bathing, forest bathing, um, and there's a, a growing body of research that you don't even have to garden, just being out in, in nature um, has benefits, including better recovery from surgery. That's a pretty definitive, not subjective data point. Better recovery from surgery, less anxiety, less depression. I'm losing my time. Being present. Um, people in the gardens, um, people with the gardens. I'm, I'm met a, oh no, here's one thing I don't, don't want to forget. Ah. Being in the present, if you're fighting depression, you're fixated on the past. If you're fighting anxiety, you're overwhelmed by the future. With gardening, you're, in the, you're more in the present. You might be looking forward to your crops and, and sorry about the thing you just killed, but you're in the present. You're working with the dirt and you're in the, in the present. Um, a meta-analysis. Okay, and then I would like to have a community meeting where we could all just talk and have a, uh, a give and take. So we're not going to come after you like the villagers after Frankenstein with torches and things. Um, I think we just okay. want to have, this is not a controversial topic, so we could have open discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Jo Poole, followed by uh, Paola, followed by Samara, Siamara. What is that? 
Oh, hello. So, yeah, so it's hard to tell. Never know what I'm going to say when I come up here, um, but I'd like to follow the theme of what you all have been talking about, about building community, building healthy community. And I was thinking as I was listening to people talk, I've been part of two community gardens, one at UCSB when I was an undergrad there, and it was a great experience, right? Helped with those fresh vegetables to get us through to the end of, you know, until the next student loans came out, which is a whole different story. Um, um, but anyway, so, and then also the one here locally at Vista beneath the Juarez Gardens. Um, you know, my husband, before he passed away, we spent many, 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 I'm going to get emotional, <laughs> days there um, building community, right? And the resources that are in this community and the Latino community specifically are amazing. People who could grow anything out of a rock, seriously. And they are so underestimated in, in this community. Um, you know, community gardens, as Kathleen said, there's documentation. It relieves um, depression. It's meditative, right? Um, there's just, you know, you can grow healthy, pesticide-free food, right? We're talking about pesticide-free pesticide -free cannabis. What about pesticide-free food, right? This helps, you know, when my husband passed away and, you know, with stagnation of wages, the community garden here provided my family, my daughter and I, with salad, beets, you know, Swiss chard, you know, for probably six or seven weeks. It helped me stretch my budget out. You know, you all have extraordinary power up here. Right, and, and I truly believe that all of you want the best for people in our community. But with your power, you also have the ability to impact people in their daily lives by providing the space and the resources to beautify their community, to grow fresh food, to connect back to the earth, to practice their cultural culture, you know, um, you know, preferences and, and things from, from homes, right, where they've, they missed. My husband, the first community garden, my husband was from Brazil. You think I'm a mess? You, should, you know, he's like, he was like wild, right? And he just took seeds and just threw them. And he's like, oh, that's a Brazilian garden, right? And that meant so much to him. And to be able to grow collard greens, because that was something he grew up on. Right, so I just hope that you will all see it in your hearts and understand your extraordinary power that you can help feed people. It's not enabling people, it's enabling them to eat. That's all, and to survive, so thank you. Thank you. Paola, is it Ileskas, is that right? Yes. <laughs> okay, and followed by Ziomara Diaz and Carol Jeffries. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Paola Ilescas. Um, I come here on behalf of a Healthy Vista Coalition and also a Poder Popular group, as some of you might know. Um, and if you don't, Poder Popular is um, a legacy longstanding community group um, that is rooted in Townsite. So uh, uh, Poder Popular has been one of the community groups that has been um, uh, observing the, asking and observing the need for community gardens in, in and around Vista, um, specifically in the Townsite neighborhood. Um, we really believe that um, community gardens and also other creative forms of urban agricultural uh, practices or um, solutions can provide opportunity for low cost redevelopment. So um, hearing beautification, right? Hearing that um, this can provide um, an opportunity for uh, a low cost redevelopment for neighborhoods that like town site themselves and um, beautifying those small spaces. Um, and also it um, provides um, a potential for economic vitality. So uh, one of the my favorite gardens that I like to visit is Mount Hope Garden out in Southeast San Diego. Um, they have um, this program, this type of program called Good Food District, where they grow their own veggies, their own fruits, and they sell to their um, they sell those veggies and fruits to their uh, local businesses and neighboring businesses. Um, so it's something really uh, magnetic, but also economically um, vital for for the neighborhood that exists there. Um, and lastly, community gardens really do help with um, the environmental degradations that we are seeing today. Um, it really helps stave that off and also um, overall support a healthy local ecology and economy. Um, and so really do count on us, um, Poder Popular and Healthy Vista Coalition, to uh, provide the support to really uh, have these um, community gardens or other forms of urban agriculture come to fruition. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. My pronounce is Ziamara Diaz. 
and then followed by Carol Jeffries. Hello, my name is Yomara Diaz, and I am a resident of Vista and a member of Poder Popular. I really think a community garden will be wonderful and support a healthier and more beautiful Vista. Currently, I have a small plot at Vista High School, but not every family has a kid that goes to Vista High School. Community gardens bring families together and build healthier communities, which would be w welcomed in neighborhoods like Townside. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Carol Jeffries. Hi. Um, so, uh, Karina paints a beautiful picture for me. Uh, makes me feel happy inside to think about greenery and beautification and biodiversity. Um, uh, last year, or a couple years ago, my kids and I went to tour Google up in Irvine, and I walked away with this dystopian nightmare where they want to pave over everything, <laughs> mine every precious metal out of the earth and create isolated, isolated robotic pods for everything, and it just made me ugh, feel horrible. So this is an antidote to that horrible <laughs> picture that I came away with. Um, in, re in real life, people thrive in shared spaces, and people need trees and soil and health and air, and all those things can be provided by community gardens. Um, people have talked about, you know, having local food and opportunities to learn about gardening and um, just to be healthy mentally and physically. And uh, that people find real purpose in gardening, and it can change lives. Um, a lot of these things I've written down, we've already talked about, but um, it, what another thing that a community gardens can do is it can create agency for people to be part of their community and to make the community to be stewards of that space and to be there and to populate our outdoor spaces instead of everybody driving into their garage and closing up behind them and watching TV all night. We need people to be outside. It's a healthy thing. Um, and in a similar way that public art and public libraries make people feel like they're part of this space, so do public gardens. Um, uh, Cicero said, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. And I think we need more of the gardens. We have a great library. It's a wonderful space. The library is one of the only places you can go in your community where you can just go and be, and there's no expectation for you to buy buy anything or do anything. You can just be there. And I would love to see more outdoor spaces like that where we can just go and be and soak it in and maybe see some wildlife and the biodiversity hotspots too are, is also very important. That we need more wildlife corridors and things like that too. So just want to tack that on the end. Thank you. Thank you. That's our last speaker. So I'll go to Deputy Mayor Franklin, when does Deputy Mayor, is it now? No, it's, it's not now. Okay. <laughs> I'll, not I'll sure. relinquish it early, I don't mind. Okay. I'll keep you with your title. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, I just want to say I, I support the, uh, the idea of a community garden and uh, the biodiversity hotspots. Uh, would like to hear more. Um, I wonder, can we use uh, park development funds to pay for a water meter? Could we consider this uh, to be a public park? Um, under certain circumstances, I believe uh, park development fees could be used. So I, I'd be curious to know if there's a parcel of land that could be identified that would be suitable and uh, what uh, I, the staff drafted this list of questions. Is that right? Yeah, you're referring to the uh, community garden considerations yeah. um, and working with uh, a community group from this community clinic, um, staff did provide those considerations which dealt with, for the audience, business model, property ownership, policies and rules, selection of users, as well as maintenance and security. Did, uh, and I know we were having discussion about the Vista Community Clinic land for another uh, reason, but did anybody approach them and ask them if they'd be willing to sponsor uh, community garden on their land across uh, the street from their building? Are you referring to the land on Vail Terrace? I'm not, sh I'm not aware if uh, they have explored that land for a community garden or not. That's a thought. Um, it's certainly aligned with their goals and it'd be a way for them to purpose the land uh, for a period of time which they're not able to, to build on it. 
Um, but uh, I, I just would uh, be supportive uh, of the council encouraging staff to answer some of these questions and so that we could, um, you know, I, I generally like the idea. I've, I'm a failed gardener uh, in many respects in my own backyard, but I, I certainly enjoy it. I've, I've killed more than I've grown, but it's a lot of fun and uh, certainly want everybody to be able to enjoy gardening. And uh, I like the idea of, uh, you know, proactively uh, cultivate um, biodiversity. Um, I'm a committed conservationist. Uh, my, one of my heroes, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the father of conservationism. Um, you know, I, I believe in being in the outdoors and, uh, and being good stewards of the outdoors, and I think the uh, biodiversity hotspot would be, uh, would be part of that. So uh, that might be fun to have, uh, and you know, the, the, the folks at VID might even be willing to partner with us in, in some way on these projects. So maybe we should reach out to them. I certainly could talk to some of my colleagues there, former colleagues. Councilmember Rigby. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I think community gardens are great. Um, and I, I like the, the quote that you brought up. I think you said it was Cicero. Libraries and gardens and you have all you need. In a previous iteration of my life, I was actually a librarian. And so um, I appreciate that. And a gardener with experiencing my own joys and frustrations. Um, and the many frustrations in my garden made each joy that much sweeter. So I appreciate what your comment was, too. Um, I have visited the Benita Juarez Gardens uh, here a couple of times, been over there to do things, and then also took a tour of some of the community gardens down in San Diego. Uh, a couple of years ago, the state of California was offering tax incentives for property owners to put in a community garden um, and I touted my little red wagon all over town trying to get private property owners and owners of some of these vacant parcels to step up and, and donate it or work with the city for, for a community garden in return to get tax credits from the state. And there wasn't a single taker. Nobody was interested in doing it. So um, I am absolutely in favor of uh, trying to see what we can get if we can get some traction on a community garden at this point. I do know that, that uh, Vista Community Clinic was going to be talking to us about something with their parcel. And this seems like it would be in theme with what they were asking or what they are going to ask or have asked. And it could be a conversation to have with them because I think that would be a great place. So I'm absolutely in support of uh, seeing what we can do to facilitate a community garden in our city. Before I go back to Councilmember Contreras, I, um, I don't know, like the city, if we should take the lead on this, or there's like nonprofits and churches and schools that have land. I know that there's there's a church, uh, is it the is it the, is it the Presbyterian? What's the church out on um, by by Sprouts? Grace. Presbyterian, yeah, Grace Presbyterian. That's what I was going to, yeah. So they have a really nice community garden out there, and I know there's the one on Benito Juarez over there. So, but um, maybe some of the churches or the schools have a lot of land too, and some of them have little gardens, but maybe they would donate some land for a community garden. So I just would like to, you know, as well as looking at the community clinic, other nonprofits, other churches, and maybe some of the schools to look at for, for, for land. So um, that would be my thoughts on it. Uh, and so um, Councilmember Contreras, I'll put it back to you, and then um, Councilmember Green wanted to talk too. And certainly uh, Mayor Ritter, um, looking at you know different areas of opportunity where we can establish a community garden or biodiversity hotspots, uh, looking at private land, uh, you know I, I think that's great. We do have public land though. We the city um, does have uh, certain parcels that could be dedicated to this. Um, and again, also you know maybe if it's a smaller parcel, depending on where it's at. Uh, Maybe we have some wildflowers there, you know, maybe we have, we, we look at what can be done um, that's site suitable. Uh, you know, one of the things I requested from staff was a list of, uh, of city-owned parcels. Um, I got a little bit, I didn't get the full thing. So one thing I would like to see, um, because I have no problem taking time, going through a full list of city-owned property 
And, you know, I, I'm not a, a, a whiz at GIS or anything like that, but I think I can figure out uh, how to use the system and, and, and how to uh, uh, take a look at this parcel and see, you know, maybe this one's not a good one. Um, I don't mind doing the filtering for that, whatever the case might be. Um, but we definitely have public land available. Uh, maybe not a ton where it's like an acre plus, right? Uh, but, you know, one of the considerations um, that, that we should look into when discussing community gardens as well is just accessibility uh, and how far it is from a residential area that might, uh, you know, want to use it. Because uh, I don't want to set it up for failure where, you know, it's just we found this piece of land, but no one really lives around it or no one that lives around that land is actually interested. So I do want to have some kind of correlation um, between the location and who is uh, looking to use it, right? Um, but I think there's a lot of questions that we need answered. And I uh, am really delighted to hear from my colleagues that you know there wants, uh, we wanna have an exploration of how we can uh, pursue uh, biodiversity and community gardens uh, here in the city. So, uh, and, and I think we do, we have to look at every single thing because there is a cost associated to it. And you know, when we're looking at running it, uh, you know, I would be in favor of a nonprofit uh, taking taking the reins of uh, of managing it, um, and perhaps you know we are a, a financial partner in the sense that you know maybe we're the ones who fund the hooking up the of the water um, and and stuff like that. But you know the day to day operations are maintained by a, a different organization. So. Um, you know, I did provide staff with a list of a few questions, um, and I really thank uh, staff for for taking a look at that uh, and providing us with some answers. It is part of the public record, so you can take a look at the agenda report for this item, and the uh, question and answers are listed there. Um, but I think it's great to hear that you know, we want to explore uh, this as a possibility. So thank you. Councilmember Green. All right, so I'm definitely down for exploring it and checking it out. Um, obviously, my idea was a little bit more of maybe setting up like a grant program for um, the community gardens or biodiversity hotspots. My main concern is from a liability aspect, and I know those are questions that we're going to need to have answered as far as what type of access do we have to provide for ADA, and if somebody gets hurt while they're gardening there. I mean, people do get injured when they're been moving big plants and digging. I mean, I don't shovel very often, but um, as far as what our liability is, so I like the idea of a nonprofit. When you put something on city land, that's where I figure like we have more liability. So I think offering a grant program would be a better approach just because it kind of takes our liability out of it. And then it says, hey, everybody, we have free money here for community gardens. You know, maybe we pay the money to put a water meter on the, you know, Vista Community Clinic's lot. I mean, maybe there's a reason why they're not doing it. So, um, but, but like I said, I, I think it was a good item brought forward. It's definitely a nonpartisan issue. It's something that will beautify our city and uh, something that we can all come together for uh, that we can definitely help our citizens out with. So I'd like to see the information, but I definitely want to approach it cautiously um, from a liability and uh, cost standpoint per se. So that's where I'm at. But I would also say that we need to think about, like, how do you choose the people who, who if, they, if they don't pay their bill, do you have to have a fence around it? You know, I mean, there's, there's a, on the you know, public pri property, can you really fence something and keep some of the people out if it's on a city land? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of questions to, you know, that, that. So I would just, okay, so Councilmember Contreras. Yeah, I, I mean, there are tons of questions um, regarding this. So, you know, I think it's gonna warrant, uh, at minimum, one other discussion right, where we're looking at what answers we get back from staff regarding liability. I don't know if perhaps, you know, that was a, a concern of mine as well. Um, I did have a conversation with our city manager uh, regarding that, and it, it didn't seem as though it would be um, as much of an issue as I initially thought. I don't know if perhaps uh, there's a granule of information uh, regarding liability that we can address at this time in this discussion? I think it's best to probably come back to you 
with uh, a lot of information that we've been able to research. Sounds good. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Franklin. <clears throat> uh, Councilman Green, I, I liked uh, what you had to say. That was a smart idea with the grant concept. And uh, Councilwoman, can, uh, I, I agree with what you were saying uh, about um, having a nonprofit involved. And I, I like the idea of, I was, and you know, it's like when the, uh, when the art festival, you know, I, and I encouraged them and I contributed to them and I said, go out and raise the money. Uh, there are people who will give, maybe we can help, uh, maybe we should do a matching grant fund. But I like the idea of having private ownership and operation. And I definitely like the idea of having uh, private governance of it. Like, you know, wherever it is, they elect their own board and somebody's gotta be in charge and they're not calling the parks department uh, on Sunday morning because somebody ate their tomatoes. You know, it's gotta be somebody else's, uh, you know, they've gotta, they gotta self-govern it. So, but, but if we could be the catalyst to get it going, I think that'd be cool. So do you have enough information? I do. He does, okay. Okay, with that, that oh, that's our last discussion item. Okay, we're going, <laughs> I, for sure. Oh, we have, we have one speaker in oral communications. So Cindy oda Amen. is Cindy still here? Okay, I see. Thank you, Mayor and a council member for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I was just, just the hearing about the community garden was like a fresh breath of air, just sounds so wonderful. Uh, what I want to speak today is that uh, I wanted to congratulate um, Corinna Contreras on her first year anniversary. I want to thank you very much for your hard work on behalf of our district and the whole city of Vista. I am uh, thankful for your thoughtful and insightful views that you bring to this chamber. It is clear to me that you've done your research and come prepared to these meetings. I really appreciate that. Also, I'm especially thankful, thankful for your effort to stay in touch with our community by ho holding monthly inclusive town halls, by providing translate, translation service to the sp Spanish-speaking members. Town halls have been inspiring as you start the start the e start each meeting by recognizing special community members for their leadership. Also, when having the city staff come speak to, have, come speak to us have been very educational. I want to express my gratitude for your ability to listen to the needs of our community. It is very much needed and very much appreciated. It is also important for us to know that our views matter. M my heart felt things and, and keep up the great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will. Um... Good job, council member. <laughs> actually, actually, everybody is celebrating an anniversary. <laughs> so I'll go on from there. So I have some mayor comments and then I'll go on down the line for you guys. So the city is still collecting new unwrapped toys or gift cards for its adopted marine unit and their families. You can, the drop-off boxes are located here in the Civic Center lobby and at Jim Porter Recreation Center through December 24th. So we still have another good couple weeks before that. Uh, the Wave Water Park is holding its annual penguin plunge this Saturday, December 14th from 2 to 4. Is Councilmember Green going to do the this year? Yes. Are you going to do it again this year? Yes. You did it last year, right. So you can come and watch Councilmember Green on the penguin plunge this Saturday, December 14th from 2 to 4. The event's free and participants will receive a free 2020 Wave admission ticket. That's why you're doing it, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Construction on the new traffic signal on Bobeer Drive at Goodwin Drive near Vista High School has begun. A new diagonal crossing at Bobeer and Panther Way will be um, added to accommodate the high, volume, the high volume of school pedestrians. So construction will be completed in the spring, but for a while there's going to be construction going on there for that new traffic signal at, at Bobeer and Goodwin. If you're leaving town for the holidays, call the Vista Sheriff's Senior Patrol to schedule a free vacation home check, and they'll come by and check your home to be sure everything is good. Um, their number is 760-940-4434. Again, it's 760-940-4434. And 
This is our last council meeting of the year, so happy holidays, everybody, and happy new year. Oh my gosh, it's coming fast, isn't it? So, okay, with that, I will go on down the line to, I'll start with council member Rigby, <laughs> almost Thank to be you, deputy mayor. mayor. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who came out tonight and uh, all of you who are still here. We don't usually have a lot of people left at the end of the meeting. So I want to say thank you for coming out and participating in our meeting and speaking to us if you did. And I want to say thank you to staff for all the hard work that you do, not just on behalf of us, but on behalf of our entire city. And Merry Christmas to everybody, and I wish you all a very happy new year. Deputy Mayor Franklin. Uh, just Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy Holidays to everybody. Thanks for a great year. Councilmember Green. So yes, I 100% will be doing the polar bear plunge on Saturday. Um, I do trunk it, no wetsuit, no nothing. I'm hardcore, so feel free to come <laughs> down. You want to see a chubby dude go down a water slide and scream real loud at the end? This guy is available for that. Um, number two, I just want to take a moment to thank our engineering planning department, specifically our traffic engineering department. I live off of Foothill and Vista Way over there, and recently they've made some changes where now we have two left-hand turns on a few different lights down there and it has really helped out with the left-hand turns in the morning the school traffic just the restriping of those roads and the additions of those turns lanes have been huge um, so thank you so much and also they were so responsive with my car smashing potholes and things after all those rains um, they got them all fixed public works props to you uh, Kuhn and the boys thank you you guys are prime time out there um, but I just want to thank traffic engineer I mean we do a lot to make sure we have proper infrastructure in the city and once those two left-hand and turn lanes open up on Foothill at least, being able to get out of the Chevron in the mornings on your way to Vista High School. I mean, it's, it's made a huge difference. So you guys are making a difference. You're doing good work. Thank you so much. Councilmember Contreras. Really good discussion today. Thank you. Um, our last council meeting of the year. It was a good one. I want to wish everybody the merriest of holidays. And... Um, also, just remind, uh, hopefully rain won't be a situation on, on Wednesday morning, but every single Wednesday morning, we have a group of volunteers that get together at Luz Duran Park. We start walking at 9 a.m., and we just pick up trash till about 11, 11.30. And um, I want to thank staff because, you know, Sometimes on our walks, we encounter like a lot of trash in an area and we don't want to have to lug that all the way back. So we, I, I put in a request for a special uh, pickup and, um, and it happens. So, uh, and, and you know, the, the really great thing is that, I mean, I love my car and you know, it, it's, it hurts me to say that because I'm like, oh, this environmentalist, but I love driving my car. It's... <laughs> So I don't always get the perspective of a pedestrian, but going out with this volunteer group has forced me uh, to have, you know, my eyes in a different situation, looking at, at, uh, at the infrastructure differently. And, you know, we've, as we're walking, we'll make a list if we run into something that, you know, could be fixed. And again, thank you so much, staff, Public Works, uh, for, you know, taking on this challenge of, of this ever-growing list. And whether it's a little minor tweak or, you know, red curbing that needs to get done, um, it's all being reviewed. And we've seen a significant amount of change. So um, I'm just really thankful for the city and... Um, and the community that I live in because people just give so much of their time to make sure that Vista is the best that it can be, including my colleagues. So uh, everybody have a really fantastic rest of your 2019. Uh, 2020 is coming, and um, I look forward to talking about community gardens and biodiversity hotspots again. So everybody have a good one. 
And I forgot to mention we had our parade on Saturday in, in the in the rain. We were, was, but it wasn't a heavy rain. It was like a nice mist. <laughs> Still got you wet, <laughs> but it was. And we had lots of people out there. I was surprised. All their umbrellas and and Joe did it. Or Joe, Councilmember Green did a great job of announcing. <laughs> I I heard that he made everybody feel very welcome and and you know did ad libbed a little when the people were going by and said he they said he knew a lot of people. I heard good re reports from you. So <laughs> you did a great job with that. So okay, I'll put this on to our city manager. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> uh, a couple updates. Uh, so we were going to show Elf last Saturday night at the <laughs> moonlight, but yeah, it, we the anticipated rain. the rain and we were going to provide snow. And so we decided to postpone that to Friday night, uh, which is December 13th. So if anybody has purchased tickets for Elf for the past weekend, they can use those this uh, uh, Friday night, the 13th. And if they cannot use those, they can go to Vistix and get a refund. So no problem there. Um, city offices will be closed from December 25th to January 1st. So if you have uh, trash between uh, <laughs> Christmas week and New Year's week, it'll be uh, set back for one day. And um, we do have two lots in town that will take um, trees if you'd like to dispose of your uh, natural tree. Uh, those two lots, one will be at Shadow Ridge and Melrose, and the other lot will be off of Mercantile on South Santa Fe. And they will be available from December 26th to January 6th. And so there's more information uh, on the city's website for that. I want to say congratulations and goodbye uh, to Tony Winnie, who is our assistant what? to the city manager. Tony uh, is net going to become, after the first of the year, the assistant city manager for the city of National City. So it's a promotion for Tony and a great opportunity. And Tony's done a great job with the city for the last five years currently. And he was here before in 2007 for a couple of years. And uh, Tony's been a great member of the team. And so I just want to wish Tony the best of luck in National City. And uh, close out by saying happy holidays and happy birthday to Theron Dykeman, our Parks and uh, <laughs> Community Service uh, Director, whose birthday was on uh, Sunday, and Kevin Ham, whose birthday is tomorrow. Tomorrow, right. <laughs> and then if, I don't want to miss anybody. And this guy right here, our city attorney, his birthday is on December 30th. So happy holidays, happy birthdays to uh, the three of you. Okay. City Attorney, do you have anything tonight? Uh, just... The happiest of holiday wishes, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to everybody, uh, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that means everybody. <laughs> How about our city clerk, Kathy? I would also Dallas. like to wish everyone happy holidays and also a happy new year. Thank How about you. Claire down there? Same, the same, okay. And I'd like to wish everybody happy holidays, Merry Christmas, have a great kind of a vacation. I'm sure some of us aren't working all the time, so have a good vacation, everybody, okay? We're adjourned. <laughs>